the month, we go back to the basics of Christian teaching. In the first article of the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. Now, the Nicene Creed that we use sometimes in church expands that a little more and says, I believe in God who, who created all things visible and invisible. Yes, God made things that we normally and ordinarily can't see. Today, our lessons point out especially that God created angels. God created them, treated them to be servants and messengers. They represent him. The very word angel comes from a Greek word, angelos. It means messenger. In other words, they don't originate the ideas. They don't start with the idea. They are the servants of God that was made to do his will wherever it comes from, whenever it comes from him. Angels are beings of spirit. That is, they don't have bodies as a rule. They can at times be seen visibly, but they don't have a body such as we do. They're, they have great power, and it's given to them by God. Now, one thing that we have to admit is that we don't know exactly every detail about them. The Bible talks about some angels being seraphim, some as cherubim. The book of Isaiah talks about some of them with six wings, some to fly with, some to cover their eyes, some to cover their feet. In other words, the word pictures trying to show that they are humble before God, that, that they can go wherever he needs them to go, but they never hold themselves up as equal to God. Matter of fact, in the New Testament book of Revelation, when John is in the presence of an angel who's telling him these mysteries of heaven, he starts to bow down to the angel. The angel says, no, don't do it. Only worship God. Angels are to be appreciated as fellow creatures or creations of God, but they are most certainly not God. How many angels? Armies full of them. The old the King James language used heavenly hosts. That doesn't mean someone who serves drinks and, and canapes. Host means armies. There are literal armies, thousands upon thousands, Revelation says, of these beings that were made by God to do his will. But one thing we have to remember is people don't become angels. I know that you've seen it time and again on Wonderful Life, Clarence, but that's all made up. We humans were made from the dust of the earth, and God breathed in us a living spirit. He didn't do that for the angels. He gave us a body. And even though we've sinned and our bodies one day will return to the earth, God will resurrect and glorify those bodies, and body and soul will be in heaven along with those spirits, the angels, and together humans glorified like Christ who was glorified, his body restored and perfected after the, and made holy after the resurrection. So we, body and soul, will be differentiated from the angels of us, it said, that we will reign with our Savior. Now, there are a lot of amazing things done. We know the might of the angels. At times, they do God's will by keeping us from getting in further trouble. Remember, an angel with a flaming sword kept Adam and Eve from eating the tree of life so that they wouldn't live forever apart from God on the earth. Instead, they would be saved by the one who is the way, truth, and life, Jesus Christ. Then we also saw the angel of death that appeared and killed the firstborn of all the Egyptian households and stables to free the people of God at Passover. Jacob saw angels ascending and descending as he fled from his brother Esau and had that dream at the rock, the place called Bethel. We know that one angel could kill a thousand men, 185,000 as a matter of fact, when the army of the Assyrian general Sennacherib had surrounded Israel, Jerusalem, the capital, God sent one angel and he wiped out a whole army in one night. Later on, angels kept the 
armies of Syria and Damascus from capturing Elisha the prophet. And they led them instead blinded to where they were received with kindness in Samaria and sent back home. Angels also appeared to Daniel during his time of exile in the land of Babylon, telling him that God was in charge of his people, that the angels were there to protect God's people. Those are Old Testament references to angels. New Testament, we see a number of angels acting. We saw Gabriel come to Zechariah in the temple and tell him he would have, and his wife, his aged wife Elizabeth would have a child named John who would announce the coming Savior. Gabriel then went to Mary and told her that God in his mercy had picked her and given her grace to be the mother of his only son, the Messiah, Jesus. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, again, the army of angels, a choir, I wish I could have heard it then, we'll hear it later, of perfection and glory that those shepherds heard out on the hills around Bethlehem. Jesus was ministered to by an angel when he was out in the wilderness. After he had defeated the devil, angels ministered to him after the temptation. An angel appeared to him after he had sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. After Jesus rose, angels told the women looking for his body in the tomb, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And when Peter was arrested for telling people about the risen Savior, an angel came and made the doors all open and the chains fall off and led him out back again to safety. We know that God sends angels to help his people. I had an experience once that I'm sure an angel was present as I slid on an icy road in my first parish in Saskatchewan. There's no other reason why that car straightened out, but I think the good Lord straightened it with the work of a heavenly host and I've always thanked him for that blessing that day. But sadly, not all angels are good. As we read the second lesson today, thank you for reading that, a few of these creatures, limited, finite, bigger than us, but finite creatures, thought they could take over heaven. How foolish. The one who called himself Satan, or the devil, led some others but they were no match for God. The Creator is greater than the thing He made. So Michael and the other angels at God's behest threw the devil down to earth, which means he's here now. We can't see him, but he calls himself the prince of this world or the prince of the air. Well, the prince of the air sounds pretty good because how, temp- how permanent is air? The wind blows through and it's gone, and Satan will one day be blown away, blown down, sent to the doomy, the doom of hell with its destruction, its flames, its darkness, its agony. But until then, Satan, since he couldn't defeat God, tries to, tries to hurt God or get at him by attacking his people. One of the ways he does it, he's called the accuser. The Bible reading we had said, no longer will he accuse our brothers. Because not only did Satan deceive Adam and Eve, As soon as they did, he said, See, they're sinners. They don't belong with you, God. They're mine. I'll take them with me to hell. But the accuser was defeated. Remember, when Satan appeared in the garden and tempted Adam and Eve, God told him his doom. I will send one born of woman who will crush your head after you strike his heel. Jesus came and took a body like us, looked vulnerable. The devil attacked him. But Jesus defeated him with obedience, perfect obedience and holiness to his Father. So Jesus defeated the devil. He crushed his power. Now when the devil says, you're a rotten person. Think of what you did back when you were a teenager. Remember remember the awful thing you said yesterday? We can say, but Jesus died and forgave that sin. Take it up with the one whose blood has washed away my guilt. You, Satan, have no power over me. Jesus has forgiven me and set me free, and the devil has to go away. When people feel troubled by their past or or feel a strong spiritual assault, when people feel overwhelmed, I often tell them to go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Do not fear, little children, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
when Satan attacks, oh, he could overwhelm you and me, but we don't stand up again with our own goodness. We have none. We say, take it up with my Savior. Like that one song we said, he's the shield we hide behind. He's our defender, our protector. Christ, save me from the evil one, and his power is no more. He will be thrown in down to that lake of fire one day. And all that believe in Christ, people who have been washed in the blood, connected to Christ in baptism, and the angels will all praise him. And do you know there's something about, you know that the angels don't know? These eternal beings that, that never sinned? The angels in heaven don't know what it's like to be loved the way you've been loved. You see, the ones in heaven never sinned, so they never had to be forgiven. But they look down with wandering eye to see how would it feel to be loved so much that even though we didn't deserve it, even though we should be destroyed, the very maker of all things, the Holy Son of God, for each one of us individually, in boundless, limitless, inexplicable love, died and rose for you. You're loved in a way the angels were never loved. Jesus died for you, not for them. He washes and makes you new and says, you'll reign with him in heaven. So, in heaven we'll see the seraphim and cherubim and Michael and Gabriel and the others. But most of all, with the angels, we will see the face of our Savior. The glory of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. And together with perfect voices in endless harmony, we'll praise Him. Until that day, we're thankful that God sends His angels to keep watch over us, to help protect us, to remind us that He's with us. That is indeed God's great gift to us. The angels that do His will of assisting us. And that's our catechism lesson for today. I hope it was helpful and upbuilding for you.